the Hosanna Fellowship Program. We're so glad that you've joined us. We're here on Sunday mornings from 6.30 a.m. to 7, and we're so glad that you're here. Uh, if you'd like to go back and look at previous episodes, because we have been doing some successive studies, if you will, uh, you can go to our website at www.hosannafellowship.org, and there's a little tab there that you can uh, click on, and it'll take you to our YouTube page and, and all of the previous episodes. We're so thankful to have this opportunity to be with you in the morning uh, on, uh, on Sundays, and we're really excited about what God has been speaking to us through His Word and what has been proclaimed on this program. Uh, we really do believe that the proclamation of truth and love uh, can, ch can change and transform lives and culture. We know that this is true because truth is a person and love is a person and His name is Jesus. And we know that Jesus is not only able to change the human heart, but He's also willing to. And so that's why we're on this program, to, to really proclaim truth and love, to to, to really declare to you uh, this morning that not only are you loved, but God's truth, His Word is truth and can bring life into dead places. And so over the uh, last, gosh, many months, we've been going through the Gospel of John, and we've finished the Gospel of John, and we're now looking at the book of Acts. And that's what we're going to be uh, studying. We, we did an introductory to the book of Acts chapter 1 from uh, l last week's uh, message. And so now we're going to look at Acts chapter 2. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about Acts chapter 2 and just uh, uh, really address the very first part and then we'll go into the rest of the chapter. So if you have your Bible or your electronic device, turn to Acts chapter 2 verse 1 and we'll get started. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, that's what I want to talk to you today about. I want to talk to you about Pentecost. Now, Pentecost is, uh, has a lot of different names in the Scripture. As a matter of fact, some of those names are called, uh, you know, on the Jewish calendar, the Feast of Weeks. It's Shavuot. Uh, it's the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And then uh, Pentecost, these are all represent the same time on the Jewish calendar. And for us to really understand what, uh, what that means, we probably ought to look at the Old Testament scriptures that describe this time of period on the Jewish calendar, and it will help us. And you can look and find this. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 9 through 10. And it says, You shall count seven weeks. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time the sickle is first put to the standing grain. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a freewill offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. And so just to, just to kind of re remember what all that is, okay. Pentecost was the celebration of the feast that was instituted in this time of what's called the unleavened bread feast. And it celebrated the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt. And you might remember that when you consider, you know, uh, Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. They took the Passover lamb and they put the, ble uh, the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and on the, on the lentils of the doorpost and on the lentils of the doors. And the, uh, and the death angel passed over. Uh, and so the firstborn was spared in the homes that had the blood on the doorway or the door, uh, doorpost. And so we know that that's really a, a type and a shadow literally of what Christ has done for us as our Passover lamb. Uh, death now passes over us. We're protected and we've been given eternal life in Christ. Well, so then, as that celebration was instituted uh, in, in the Pentateuch, it was instituted as a result of God's command, there were other feasts that were placed on uh, the calendar. And these are, are called the Feasts of the Lord. And so the, the, one of those feasts is this Feast of Weeks, which is the second major feast, if you will. And it, it has and holds within it this celebration that we call Pentecost. Now, this is an important time on the Jewish calendar, but it's also an important time, if you will, 
uh, on the calendar of the church because we would say that, you know, many people would say that, the Pent- that Pentecost was the, the birthday of the church in some, in some regard. Now, we can make some arguments about that because we know that the scripture tells us that, uh, that, that really the church was in the heart of God before the beginning of time. But that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother discussion, not for today. So what I do want to talk, though, is about this particular, this particular feast of, of, of Pentecost. The wave offering, which was mentioned in that passage that we just read, is the day after the Sabbath in Passover. So when Passover took place, that was itself a Sabbath. And then the Sabbath after it uh, is, is called the Feast of First Fruits. And, and literally, if you look at the calendar, when Jesus rose again from the dead after that Passover, he is our first fruits. He's the one who came up from the ground uh, after Passover, and he was a wave offering, if you will, of, of God's victory over death, hell, and sin. And so what we see is, is that Jesus is our first fruits. But then we know that the continuation of the Feast of First Fruits of the grain harvest continues on in Leviticus 23, 15 through 17. It says this, you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. So that was the day Jesus was resurrected. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be a fine flour and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. And so on that Pentecost day, there would be two baked loaves of bread, if you will, waved before the Lord. And, uh, and I, I was listening to one uh, minister who, who, who happened to be a Jewish believer, and he said he believed that those two, wave, those two loaves being waved really was the Jew and the Gentile being waved together as a part of this new economy of God in what's called the church or the ecclesia. So significantly, just as Jesus was raised to life by the Holy Spirit, and was the first fruits from the dead. Now there are multiple stalks of grain harvested 50 days later. It started with the barley harvest and ended with the wheat harvest. And so here are all these uh, people gathered in one place. <clears throat> we know that there was 120 that were gathered together. And then later on after Peter preaches this message in, in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people are actually brought into the kingdom. Now there's these multiple stalks of grain, if you will, that are now a part of this harvest. So I really think that's really important. And Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33, which some would argue is the beginning of the New Testament, if you will, because it's this introduction of the new covenant says this. It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And like the covenant, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, the giving of the law was considered a marriage contract between God and His people. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah 2.2 refers to the fact that Israel followed Him into the wilderness as a betrothed wife or bride. The law, the teaching, or the Torah was given to them in the wilderness and they rejected it and they rejected Him. Now, the Lord's promise in Jeremiah 31 is to write this law on our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That's what he promised. That it would now no longer be something that would be written on tablets of men, but it would be written on our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so we know that when they went into the wilderness, they went into the wilderness as the betrothed. And what did God do when they were in the wilderness? He gave them the law. 
It was as if you would see a marriage contract being delivered to them. Moses was coming down off the mountain with these two tablets and what were they doing in the valley below? Well, if you know the story, they had made a golden calf and they were now worshiping it and they were dancing and partying and they were doing all those kinds of things. As a matter of fact, Joshua, who was with Moses at the time, says to Moses, Moses, do you hear that? What's that? That sounds like the sound of war. And, and Moses shook his head. I, well, not Moses shook his head, but, but Moses said, no, that's not the sound of war. That's the sound of a party. And when he got down to the bottom, of course, there they were worshiping the golden calf. And he took the, the, the tablets of stone and he threw them to the ground. Why? Because the marriage covenant, if you will, had already been broken. Now, I want you to understand a little bit about Jewish weddings, and, and I, I don't claim to be an expert, but I have done some study in this uh, area. When a groom would arrange a marriage contract with the bride's father, they were betrothed. And in essence, they were married, legally. For all intents and purposes, they were married, but they had not consummated the marriage. Okay? So the, the bridegroom would leave, and he would go to prepare a place for his bride, and this process could take sometimes up to a year for him to, to go and, 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 and make a place ready for her in his father's home. Just so she would not forget about him and know that he was thinking about her, he would send her a gift called a matan. The gift was generally meant to adorn her for the consummation of their wedding day. Now, this might be a little under, more understandable when you read, for instance, the, the Gospel of, of Matthew or you know, even the Gospel of Luke, where we know that Joseph and Mary were betrothed, but they had not consummated their marriage. And when he found out that she was with child, he was, you know, he was willing to put her away privately. He was willing to divorce her because... She was pregnant, and in his mind at that time, of course, with another man. But the, the reality is, is that according to the Scripture, it was by the Holy Spirit that she was now pregnant. And the Lord spoke to Joseph and told him that that was the case. So instead, he didn't put her away, but instead they actually were married. But the Scripture tells us that he did not know her. He did not consummate that wedding or that marriage until after she had had baby Jesus. And so... Uh, and so then also Jesus tells us in, in John chapter 14, he goes, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in, you believe in God, believe also in me. And, and he goes, I'm getting ready to go away from you, but I'm, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And it was really in this context, it's a, it's a lot of marriage talk in the sense that God was, uh, is going to, you know, Jesus is going to be with the Father to prepare a place for us so that he would come back and get us. And in the meanwhile, he sends us a gift, a matan. And that's what brings us to Acts chapter 2. Because it's a part of the new covenant. God was going to and is writing his law, that contract, if you will, on our heart by the Holy Spirit. And so now the disciples are now no longer just going to be uh, you know, disciples of Jesus, they're going to be inhabited by His Spirit. And that same Spirit is available for us to be filled with as well. And so let's look at the passage and let's read on. This is Acts chapter 2. I just want to read verses 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? 
Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they're full of new wine. Now, one of the characteristics identified for the first church in this passage is this, that they were in one accord in one place. Homo thumadin. That's what this word, the Greek word is homo thumadin. That means with one mind, with one accord, with one passion. There's a big difference between unity and uniformity. And, you know, really what we see in our culture today is not an attempt for unity. We're seeing in the culture today a real push for uniformity. Uniformity where everybody says the same thing, where everybody thinks the same thing, where everybody looks the same way, where everybody does the same thing. All of those uh, are characteristics of, 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 of this pressure to be uniform, not united. And in the early church, there was a lot of differences and there were a lot of things that they were, you know, a lot of backgrounds, a lot of cultural diversity, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, thoughts and, 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 you know, feelings about the, the people around them. Even though they were all worshiping God, there was a lot of diversity there. And guess what? God likes diversity. But he's looking for unity in the midst of it, where we have one heart, one mind, and one passion. We bring our expressions, we bring our, our, uh, our expressions of diversity into the mix, but we have one central focus. It's Jesus and His will. It's like in marriage. You've probably seen a diagram where uh, it's a triangle and God's at the top and you have the man and the woman. And the, the idea is, is that as a man and a woman uh, focus on Christ at the top and they, they pursue him, guess what happens? They get closer and closer and closer and closer together as they pursue him with that one, what's the word? Homo thumadin, one heart. And that's what God's looking for in his people is just one heart. He's looking for homo thumadin. You know, the early church was made up of diverse people with varying ages, backgrounds, sexes, and occupations. Yet, according to the passage, they were in one accord. They were, together in, they were gathered together in one place. There's something important to the body being gathered together for its fullest function. And I appreciate the medium that we have here with, the, with TV and with, uh, you know, online streaming and, and all the kind of stuff that we've been able to do, especially during this pandemic year. But there's really something when we come together as the body of Christ that expresses the fullness because it's not just me and the Holy Spirit living in me, but it's me and you and the next person and we're walking together as one and my gifts may not be your gifts and your gifts may not be their gifts and those gifts coming together encourages all of us in the process so this group however were they were unified i'm sorry they had gathered as all devout jews would do on pentecost at the temple worship and morning prayer time began at 9 a.m so they were there in accordance with the command However, even though this, this group was there, they, they were unified not just by the feast command, but in this passage, they were unified by the command of Christ. Because Jesus had told them 10 days earlier, hey, go into Jerusalem and wait there for the promise of the Father. Wait, because you're going to receive power from on high to be my witness. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. He comes into our lives and He empowers us to be Christ's witness. You know, there's a real beautiful thing that happens when the body of Christ comes together. Psalm 133 tells us something, and I, and I just want to read this to you, so I'm going to flip over to Psalm 133. And it says this. This is a Psalm of David. 
Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. It's God's desire to pour out that anointing oil, if you will, on a unified people. It's representative of his heart. And here we see in Acts chapter 2, the church is gathered together with one heart, one mind, homo thumadon, and there the Holy Spirit is poured out in such, a, in such a powerful way. Now, we know that they were there. There was a wind. The wind blew. It filled the whole room where they were. It's interesting that this wind was likened to the breath of God as Jesus breathed on his disciples. If you remember in John chapter 20, verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. That was before, way before, you know, days before Pentecost. That was actually on the day he was resurrected according to the passage. So I do not believe this was just a natural wind. It started in the room and then it blew out from there. Immediately following the blowing wind, the disciples were praising God in different languages. And they also, according to the scripture, had flames of fire over their heads. Now, a lot of people, you know, really trip up over the issue of tongues. And tongues is, a, is an interesting phenomenon. And so it would, probably would have been better had it just been translated languages. But what, what we have to understand is that there are languages of men... And then there are languages of angels, according to 1 Corinthians 13. And there's this spiritual language. And so uh, a lot of times we think, well, were they actually speaking in these languages? And if you'll read the passage closely, the scripture says they heard them speaking in their native languages. So I don't think it's necessary that they were speaking in, say, for instance, Arabic. But they heard it in their own language. I don't think it's necessary... To, you know, whatever the, the, the Parthians' language was, that they heard, they actually, that, that the disciples were speaking in that language, but that the people heard them speaking in those languages. In other words, uh, the Holy Spirit fell upon those that had gathered and they were speaking in these unknown languages, and yet at the same time, the Holy Spirit was opening the ears of people to hear the praises of God in their native languages. And so we know that. Uh, the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was marked with outward manifestations. In this case, speaking in other languages and flames of fire on top of their heads were the initial manifestations of this miracle. And a lot of people, you know, say, well, that's, that's not true. That, that, well, it, it is. When you read the scripture, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, all give us this indication that there's something outward that happens when this person is baptized you know, with, this whole, with the Holy Spirit, when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I would suggest to you that a person that's born again has already received inwardly the Holy Spirit. But a person who's been baptized, the Holy Spirit has come upon them. In other words, you can't be born again without the Holy Spirit at work in your life. And yet at the same time, there's a baptism that God wants his children to experience where the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And, and that's exactly what we see happening here in Acts chapter 2. Now, there were a lot of people asking some questions because some were saying we hear them speaking the praises of God in our own language. But there are other people that were mocking, saying they're just drunk. So not everybody apparently heard them speaking the praises of God in their own language because some were like, I don't, what, what are you talking about? These people are just crazy. They're just drunk. They're drunk with new wine. And of course, the question was, whatever could this mean? And that's what we're going to talk about next week. I want to talk to you about what God wants to, uh, what he did do on the day of Pentecost and what he wants to do through us, too, as a result of Pentecost. So we know Pentecost is on the Jewish calendar. We know that it's also considered in some, some circles as the birthday of the church or the ecclesia. 
But I would say and suggest to you that more than anything, it's a day in which uh, we, we recognize and celebrate that the Holy Spirit has been made available to mankind through faith in Jesus Christ. And I guess that's the, the primary question that we have to ask today. Have you received salvation through faith in Jesus Christ? Have you been born again? It's God's desire for you to walk in the newness of life. It's God's desire for you to experience what it means to have a life transformed. It's God's desire for you, for His law to be written on your heart. You know, this is really uh, it's, uh, um, reiterated in one of the epistles that Paul writes. He talks about us being sealed with the Holy Spirit. What's interesting is that same word for seal in this Koine Greek or this Greek language, the original language in which it was written, is still used today in Greece, and it means the engagement ring. See, he gives us the gift of the Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, to prepare us for the marriage day that's coming. Have you received? It's God's desire for you to receive. Can we pray right now? Agree with me in prayer. Father, I come before you in Jesus' name. Yeah, say it out loud right where you're at. I'm asking that you would forgive me, a sinner, and that you would give me the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin, and you raised him from the dead on the third day. I thank you for this salvation. Father, give me this indwelling Holy Spirit. Fill me. With this promise, I ask that you would empower me to be Jesus' witness in the days ahead. And I give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me or if you would like to uh, you know, get prayer for any other need you might have, you can call the number at the bottom of the screen or you can email prayer at hosannafellowship.org. Also, would like to invite you, if you, if you don't have a church home, you're welcome to join us on Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. at 715 Sunset Drive in Johnson City. We would love to have you. It's pretty casual. Come as you are, and we're going we're gonna to really endeavor to experience the presence of God as we worship Him together. And also, uh, if, you, if this, if this uh, program has had uh, uh, any kind of encouragement to you, please let us know. We'd like to know that, that it's, it's a benefit to you. We want you to know that God loves you and that he has a plan for your life and that your life can be changed and transformed by saying yes to him. God bless you and have a great day.